Okay, welcome to the October 26, 2020 Winter School Committee meeting. Uh, this meeting will be held via Zoom telephone conference. Uh, Patty, can you please call the roll? Ms. Barry? Here. Mr. Boncori? Here. Mr. Capabianco? Here. Mr. Matucci? Yep. Ms. Swope? Yep. Ms. Powell? Present. Mr. Perrin? Here. Okay, this meeting will be recorded and may be televised live. Um, Mr. Capabianco, you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America. and to the and republic, republic for which, for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. I would ask for a moment of silence um, uh, for a former high school teacher, uh, Paul Funk, who uh, recently passed away. Could you just have a moment of silence, please? Thank you. Okay. Do we have any public uh, comment this evening, Patty? There's uh, no one has their hand up at the moment. Okay. Okay, moving on. Do we have no delegates and visitors at this time? Okay, can we, has everyone reviewed the minutes of the October 13th uh, meeting? If so, can I have a motion to accept those minutes? I'd like to make a, I, I'd like to make a recommendation. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing to Patty's moment minutes that I, I did uh, make a recommendation that the reason that I didn't uh, approve something was because of the health and safety of the kids. And that's why I didn't uh, recommend my motion. And I don't know if that came into that minute at that time or whatever, whenever well, it's just a basic overview and outline of, of what the discussion was. If you want that added, we can ask Patty to add that through. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, will do. So Thank can you. I have a motion to accept the uh, minutes, uh, adding that uh, the language that uh, Ms. Swope just added? Motion to oh. minutes as amended. Thank you, Mr. Boncori. Second Thank by Ms. Powell. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, Patty, can you call the roll? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? <coughs> yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Uh, now we come to the financial and business procedures. We have a warrant, a payroll warrant. Can I get a motion for warrant SVW21-5 in the amount of $321,273.57? Motion. Motion by Mr. Matucci. Second. Second by, I'm sorry, second, second. by, by Ms. Swope. Any discussion on the warrant? Hearing none, Patty, can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Okay. Mr. Bacu Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Okay. I believe the next uh, is a payroll warrant, SPW 21-06 in the amount of $725,585.21. Can I have a motion, please? Motion. Motion by Ms. Powell. Uh, second. Second. Second by Ms. Barry. Any discussion on the payroll warrant? Hearing none, Patty, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Same. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Same. Okay, buildings and grounds, there are none. I believe there are no subcommittee reports. Um, 
this time around. Uh, superintendent's report, uh, Ms. Howard. You're on mute, Lee. You would think I would be able to figure this out by now. So um, I'm gonna start with a few things um, on my superintendent's report tonight. I'd like to start with the athletic update. So we're still, um, as all know, paused with athletics, uh, given our, our red status and uh, the fact that we're in remote. Uh, it, athletic Director Serino uh, continues to work uh, in the school. He has been uh, very busy writing um, a COVID handbook for our athletes as well as our coaches uh, and has begun the training of those folks in all the new policies and procedures. A lot of our coaches do not um, teach, some do, but um, many don't and uh, they need to be updated on all of the policies and procedures that we will be following moving forward. Um, I had the opportunity as I do weekly to speak to our assistant athletic director, Mr. Frankie Fabiano, who called me last night. Uh, he remains connected to Mr. Serino and myself, uh, speaks with us weekly, gives us updates about what's happening in town and we fill him in. He cannot wait uh, to get back to athletics in our uh, school. So shout out to Frankie uh, for continuing to communicate with us and, and stay in the loop. Um, just an update on our van. So we purchased two athletic vans with the um, help of the MSBA uh, group, which is the athletic, uh, the spending of the rest of the uh, leftover funds from the MSBA funding. So we purchased those vans um, and they came on board with us about a month ago. They are parked behind um, the field in an area that we have uh, cameras on. Unfortunately, those vans were damaged uh, about a week and a half ago uh, in which someone broke into the vans themselves, uh, took a fire extinguisher and went throughout both vans with the fire extinguisher, making uh, a very large mess. The nice thing is we were able to capture um, the event itself and work closely with the police department um, to figure out uh, who the folks were who made a poor decision uh, and we uh, submitted that information to the insurance company um, to cover the cleaning of it. We don't think anything is permanent, uh, but we're, we're happy our cameras were angled correctly uh, and we do keep a close eye on all activity on the field. So uh, I'll give you more of an update. They were coming out today to look at them and do the assessment um, and we should hear back from the insurance company this week. Um, and a little update on the um, impact of COVID-19 uh, and what, that's, how, what that has uh, had on our district this week beyond uh, the daily impact of COVID-19. Uh, everyone received a copy of the letter that I had sent out uh, to families um, and I have kept the school committee chair uh, up to date throughout the weekend um, about the event uh, that we had at our school. So just a recap um, on that. We, as everyone knows, uh, at this point in time, we have no students attending school at the Gorman Fort Banks. Um, we were uh, scheduled to have 31 of our high need students start today. Uh, we have had to put a pause on that, um, given the fact that we had uh, on Thursday, this past Thursday, um, a report that one of our staff members, unfortunately, was um, diagnosed with COVID. Um, and then again on Saturday, a second yet unrelated to the first uh, staff member um, was also diagnosed with COVID. Uh, the report that uh, I provided to uh, parents sort of gave an overview of what we did um, when we became aware of that information. So just a quick recap of that. Once we were informed, um, we have a very strict procedure uh, that goes into place immediately in which we do contact tracing uh, once we know who the member of our staff is or you know, in the event that it is a student, it's the same process that we follow uh, in which we work with the school nurse and the town nurse to do the contact tracing uh, to determine for that particular staff person, they didn't come to work that day, which um, was fine, but we were able to contact them and then figure out who they were in contact with within our school uh, and follow a procedure to figure if those folks needed to quarantine. 
after that, uh, or at the same time, actually, we immediately sanitized uh, the entire area in which the affected person uh, had been in on the prior day. Uh, and at the end of the day, we decided to, it was a Thursday, we decided to have, out of an abundance of caution, our staff teach from home on Friday. Uh, it, fortunately, we're in remote, so um, the only thing that really changed on Friday was the location of where the teachers were actually teaching. Um, and then on Saturday, our intent after Friday was to leave the building completely uh, sanitized and closed throughout the weekend. And then on Monday, um, have our staff come back, all of those uh, who could come back. There were uh, approximately six staff members that were identified as close contacts. So those six staff members would have stayed home uh, for 14 days and we were ready to open. Um, however, on Saturday, we became aware of a second case uh, that involved a staff member within our school. So we went through that very same process that we did with the first staff member on Thursday for contact tracing. Um, we did not have to do additional cleaning because we had thoroughly sanitized the entire school building. Uh, we had purchased the electrostatic cleaning machines, uh, which allow us to do a classroom in about 30, 30 minutes start to finish. Um, so over the weekend, our custodial staff uh, stayed on board and, and was able to, to have us up and ready for Monday. However, we made the choice after identifying five more staff members who would have been close contacts to the second staff member who was uh, diagnosed with COVID. Um, and that, so that took some more people uh, out of our school. Um, and then, then over the weekend, working with Meredith, uh, also working with the COVID task force from the department, the State Department of Education, uh, as well as uh, a host of other people, probably 25 other people, including uh, the building principal. Um, we made the determination to pause the entrance of our high need subgroup of students that were gonna come in today. Um, we also made the decision, I, I say we, I made the decision sort of like a snow day event to also uh, ask our staff, now that we have had two staff members uh, diagnosed with COVID and approximately 12 staff members that have to self isolate for 14 days, I made the decision to extend their teaching from a different location. Again, that would be their homes. I made the decision to extend that throughout this week. And the reasoning behind that um, really is, is not overly complicated. Now that we have 12, upwards of 12 staff members self-isolating, um, over that period of 14 days, the purpose of their self-isolation is to see if they develop symptoms of their own or in fact test positive um, during that time frame. So we took, we decided I decided to pause both the students coming in. These are students that have not been in school since March. 16th, um, and this would have been their first time back in the school environment. So as difficult as it was, it made sense not to have them come in and then uh, have to have them uh, come out. And then when we made the decision to have the teachers also stay home this whole week to really watch those numbers of the people that are self-isolating and eliminate any extra chance of having to pull more staff members out of the building or re-sanitize the building. Um, so just let me look at my notes here throughout the, the process over the weekend. Um, and I can tell you this took an entire weekend of a whole group of people working very closely together, uh, following protocols and plans that we put in place prior to the weekend. Um, these protocols are in place to make sure you have a game plan. Should something like this happen? whether we're in a hybrid model, whether we're in a, a remote model, whether it's a staff member or whether it's a student. And I can say having those plans in place uh, made a huge difference for us in terms of staying um, really focused on making sure we made good decisions uh, throughout the weekend. It's my hope that uh, over the next few days, none of the people who are home self-isolating um, have any any issues um, or have any positive tests. Uh, by the end of the week, uh, we'll get back together with the principal and, and talk about whether or not it makes sense to continue those folks from to work from home, um, all the folks, all of the teachers in that building to work from home for another week 
um, or if we are ready to come back uh, uh, next Monday. We'll also start the conversation with the PPS director, not start it, but continue it um, about our 31 uh, students in preschool through second grade that were gonna be returning to us. Um, difficult for uh, us to make those calls. One of the things we felt was important to do prior to sending that letter out to all of our families to give them an understanding of how we react to these situations. Um, Jen O'Connell and who's the PPS director and Eileen Pearson and I uh, felt strongly that the 31 students that were coming back, those families needed a telephone call and not a letter uh, to explain to them why we were pausing what has been uh, an anticipated date for them for a very long time. Um, and and it, it really hit home when thinking about our little ones who had been being prepared by their parents to return on Monday. I'm sure there were lots of conversations, lots of social stories built. Transition is not easy for um, our pre-K to two kids on a good day and then our high need students, uh, it becomes a little more complicated. And so telling them they're coming back uh, and then having to pause that was pretty difficult for us. Our parents were amazing. I can tell you that those that we were able to reach by phone um, in the morning. And once we were able to contact all of them, we then began the process of uh, telling the rest of the community. The reason we told the entire school district, all schools and not just the Fort Banks, um, was because it was more than one isolated incident. So initially with our first um, notification, it was about one staff member. And then it obviously when it became two staff members um, and we were gonna take an action to have folks work from home, we felt strongly that all of our schools needed to know that, all of our parents needed to know that so that they could have a snapshot and an understanding of what we do uh, when something like this happens. So um, I can uh, finish through my report and then, and then ask you guys if you have questions about that uh, at, the, at the end. We, uh, I talked a little bit about transitioning um, our youngest folks this Monday, which again, we paused on, but prior to that, the school committee had asked um, me and, and directed me to get as many of our high need students into our school building uh, as we could. Um, we had anticipated doing all of that this week. Um, folks on the committee asked that we try to get them in a little bit earlier. And I am happy to report that um, on October 19th, which was last Monday, right? I'm losing track of time. Um, yes, we were able to bring in um, five students of our high need students for in-person learning on Mondays and Tuesdays at the coming school. Um, we were able to bring in 18 of our high need students. They returned to three separate classrooms at Winthrop High School. They started last Tuesday. They're on a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. Up the middle school, uh, we were looking at bringing in seven of our high need students at the middle school. Uh, however, those families were just not quite ready uh, for their students to come back to in-person learning yet. And we'll uh, keep in communication uh, with them with a continued focus on that. And again, I've explained we had uh, we had 31 students ready for uh, today, and we had to put a little bit of a pause on that. Um, our, an update on our remote learning. As many have seen, we sent out a survey. Um, we provided parents with a survey last, I believe it was last week when we sent it out. Actually, I think everything sort of crashed together. The survey uh, went out uh, I believe the same day we uh, learned that we had a staff member uh, who was positive. So uh, timing is everything. Um, that went out asking parents how comfortable they were sending their children back to school uh, in a hybrid learning model. Um, and the purpose of doing that, when we sent that survey out, it went out with a cover letter and that cover letter was accompanied by links to the updated hybrid learning plan and the updated uh, full remote plan. Right now we're in full, uh, full remote where all children are learning from home with the exception of our small groups of, of high needs kids. And the remote learning that our students are doing now is pretty much uh, virtual in front of a, a teacher. Um, the teacher is engaging them pretty much the entire time through Zoom, anywhere from five and a half hours uh, for our students in grades one through 12 
uh, and about three and a half hours a day in our students uh, who are in kindergarten and, and some of our preschoolers. So when we move to a hybrid plan, uh, that look is gonna change a little bit. And we felt strongly that we had to share with parents a, a strong understanding of what remote learning was gonna look like when teachers are now in school with kids in front of them and kids at home uh, through a, through a uh, virtual model of, of uh, similar to what they're seeing now. So we, we updated those plans and attached them to a cover letter in which parents were told that we would like them to start thinking about this. What, you know, given this information about what hybrid is gonna look like and what anyone who is at home, what their schedule is gonna look like and how it's gonna be different from now um, was needed to be done for parents to be able to make an informed decision. So that went out uh, last week. We've not received a lot of feedback. The other surveys we've sent out, the feedback has come uh, very quickly and at a very high level. I've checked early this week um, early this week, it's still only Monday. So um, I checked early this morning and we had about 450 responses out of close to 1900 needed responses. Parents are not committing to anything right now. What they're doing is giving us an idea of what they're thinking in terms of, of hybrid. So um, we encourage parents to, to continue to give us their feedback. It's not mandatory, it's certainly not binding. It's to help us plan to move forward. If we don't have a sense of, of how parents are feeling and what they may do, it's very difficult for us to work with the staff we have and be able to repurpose some of those staff members. If we know we have less kids coming to a classroom than we thought, we'll be able to move some staff around. And it will also help us see where our gaps are. Uh, if staff members are not gonna be able to come back and we can't move somebody, free somebody up to that position, um, then uh, you know the hiring process will, will need to continue. We have had postings out for quite some time um, for just about every grade level. And I can tell you the applicant pool is thin primarily because everybody's doing the exact same thing um, in all the surrounding areas. So we've, uh, we're gonna send parents an update this week and uh, tomorrow most likely and ask them to make sure they complete those surveys by Friday so we can begin to crunch that data. Once all that data is crunched, um, we can uh, give parents just a little bit more information uh, and then ask them to make a decision about how they would like to move forward. Mind you, we're asking folks to make decisions about moving to a hybrid learning model and we're in week nine or, or Meredith could correct me, maybe it's week 10 of being in the red. Um, so I can't tell you when we're gonna get out of the red and move to a hybrid model. What I can tell you is that the Department of Ed and the state um, has not wavered on the fact that once a community is out of the red, they are strongly recommending you watch that data for three more reports, which is technically four uh, weeks before you make a change from a remote model to a hybrid model. Um, so there will be more to come uh, on that and we will make sure that we are keeping our parents uh, informed as well. And then the last thing, um, two more little items and then I, I can open it up for questions. November 3rd is a no school day for students. So cam uh, computer free, hopefully uh, students will uh, wear masks and uh, not shake hands with people, not hug people. Uh, and be outside perhaps in their own uh, yards playing and being active and not on the screen. Our teachers will be um, working. They will be participating in a virtual workshop through the five district partnership. Uh, the focus is on equity and the topics that they'll be uh, engaging in are as such, equity and rigor, equity, uh, empathy, integrity, and growth. And they're also gonna be working on diverse strategies of, of teaching. And so they're looking forward to that, uh, that day uh, to, to collaborate with people from the other four districts, Chelsea, Everett, uh, Malden and Revere, um, and, and spend some time uh, looking at those items that we have been focused on for quite some time now. Uh, the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship, just another um, 
bit of information. Um, those were announced last week. Um, I'm going to work with the chair to see how we want to announce those kids again. Uh, congratulations to all of them. We'd like to formally recognize them, so we will uh, most likely be able to do that in the next meeting um, and uh, read their names off and then uh, be able to provide them uh, with a certificate. And the last thing I have, um, and Laurie Gallivan, our executive director of curriculum, will jump in. Um, we're continuing our work on anti-bias and anti-racism uh, with groups of people. And Laurie, if you want to chime in just for a second and just give a quick update on that, and then I will be uh, open for questions. And I think we have Meredith on the line too, in case anyone has a question for her. Sure, um, just to bring everybody up to speed, um, I've been working with a group of parents that reached out to Superintendent Howard uh, back in the summer. Um, to just a group of concerned parents that want to be able to be a part of the conversation about uh, any type of ABAR work, and that's the acronym that's used for anti-biased, anti-racist curriculum, um, anti-biased and anti-racist work. Um, and you know, they they've really been a great group to work with. Um, a nice um, blend of kind of think partners through this whole process. We brought in a speaker during the first 10 days when teachers were um, spending a lot of time preparing for kids to return, which we unfortunately, you know, had to end up switching to remote. But, um, but we had a speaker then that did a presentation at each school that lasted about 90 minutes long. And it was just really to start the conversations. Um, and we, this is work that we are going to continue to be doing. Um, Mr. Um, Crombie and I have also met with another consultant that um, we're going to be looking to further the work with going forward. Um, we'll be meeting with her, with the superintendent um, coming up shortly. And, you know, part of the work really is around, um, you know, starting the conversations is one piece, reviewing our curriculum is a second level of it. Um, the teachers were all share, I shared with them after our first training, a document from NYU around looking at culturally um, respective curriculum and a tool to give them to use to just kind of evaluate their own as they're going through the process as we're just starting these conversations. So this is all work that's moving forward. And I, I thank the parent group and I thank the adjustment counselors who I, I also invited to our last meeting, the parent group, and it was um, a really a nice opportunity for the conversations to continue with the counselors and the parents as well. Um, and we'll keep you up to date as we move forward and um, put some more uh, work in motion. Thank and that you. was it for me, Mr. Perrin. Did you have a question, Ms. Swope? Yeah, I mean that, first of all, this is all terrific. I am I mean, very delighted about all of this. And I think um, this makes a big difference in our school community. And thank you so much um, for um, continuing this effort. I did want to ask whether, um, is, are, are you in, in, the, in the remote stuff, I, did, did uh, parents talk to you about whether they wanted to continue with remote versus hybrid? Did so, you... so, yeah, so that's, that's what the initial, the initial survey was giving out information about when we go move into a hybrid, so when we transition to hybrid, which I'm still convinced that we will pull it together and be able to do that as a community. And I wanna be clear about that because I think that is going to happen. And we are very focused on, on getting it to happen because we all agree that our, we want our students in school. We want them in front of the teachers. The teachers need them in front of them. Uh, and once we, our community is uh, not, no longer red, we will be able to do that. However, again, it's going to look a little different than it looks now because a teacher is going to be doing two things, teaching two groups and in essence, almost three groups at once. So we provided that with the parents and asked them to, with that new information, give us a sense of what you're thinking. Do you think you're going to take advantage of the hybrid model, which is two days in and two and a half days remote, or are you going, do you think you're going to choose to keep your child home fully five full days per week? The timing was not great but to send that uh, survey out. However, without their feedback, we really can't effectively plan 
we don't have a sense of how many kids are coming back in a hybrid. And again, we're asking them for their feedback. Eventually we'll, we'll ask them to commit to something, but we can't plan for our teaching staff fully unless we know how many people are gonna keep their children home. If, if there are a lot more people that are gonna keep their home than kids home than we think, that would be an issue for us because if we have teachers who are, who are teaching from home because they have an, an ADA accommodation that won't allow them to come back to work, if we know how many students are home and at what grade level, we may be able to use some of those remote teachers to actually work with those kids, which will help us not have to go out and, and find substitutes beyond what we're trying to do. And I'm, I've said this a number of times, it, we've been posting for positions, the anticipated positions since July, and the applicant pool is low. It is not a position that you can fill with volunteers, although it would be nice but when you volunteer for something, you're not committed and you don't necessarily have to show up. In a school district, we have to have people who will show up. We have to have people who are, are trained in education and understand. Um, you, of course, you have to have general substitutes sometimes, but it's very difficult to fill a biology class or a full fourth grade classroom uh, with a non-certified teacher to teach students either remotely or in person for a full school year. So once we gather that information um, back and, and you know we have about, I believe about 450, uh, last time I checked somewhere around there out of you know close to 1900 responses that we need. So a quarter of the responses is not gonna be overly helpful or accurate. So hopefully by the end of the, of the week, we will have more parents weigh in and they have to understand this is not committing you to anything. The timeliness of this is tough based on what we're going through in our community. I, I live, you know, 300 yards from here and it took me 10 minutes to get home because when I pulled out of my parking lot, I got stuck in the line for COVID testing. Oh, it's I do. I, I was there. Beautiful that folks, I'm, I'm thrilled that folks are getting tested, but it, it speaks to a sense of panic, which we need, but also, you know, how people are thinking right now. So I don't know if I'm asking them if they're gonna send their kids back to school at a point in time when there's a lot of disruption around the numbers in this community, we may not be getting an accurate reflection from parents, but it, I, I'd at least like them to give us something, even if it's how they're feeling in the moment, just please respond to us. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for the superintendent? I have one question, oh. Brian, sorry. Yes. Um, uh, Lisa, I, I'm sorry, I have actually two questions. The first is around the, um, the testing of the teachers who were in close contact with the two um, that tested positive at the school. Are they required um, per the plan to test or are they just required to uh, remain in quarantine? And how is the rest of the teachers or admin within the school um, advised to uh, test, not test, et cetera. Could you just share a little detail around that? Or maybe, sure. maybe that's a better uh, question for Meredith. I'm yeah, sorry. so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I do know the answer to the question and I could tell you, but then I'm gonna ask Meredith to repeat it because okay. uh, you know I talk a lot about staying in my own lane and testing <laughs> is not, I can follow the piece of paper that tells us what we have to do and I can ensure that it gets done. Uh, but without Meredith, I would be nothing. So Meredith, okay. I'm going to let you pop in um, to give some some clarification on the 14 days and the negative test meaning really nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know. So um, so in terms of testing in order to return to school, so I'm going to and feel free to stop me if it's a little too wordy. But um, so if so, what we know is when um, when people get tested and they come back positive for COVID. The, what the test does is it measures the presence of COVID. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily measure the infection, like the point of infectivity. So mm -hmm. um, we don't know. It, it really measures the genetic composition of the virus, the RNA virus, the presence of. It doesn't tell us if it's been present for one day, four days, or six weeks. So um, we know that based on other coronaviruses and other parts of the world, 
after 14 days, people are no longer infectious, which is why we say the 14 days. So we don't have the, the sensitivity right now in our testing to know where that is. Um, and so some people, I personally have seen some people test positive for upwards of 30 to 40 days post infection, um, like after their first round of, um, of testing. Mass General and the Brigham just recently came out and whereas initially they were having um, employees test twice before coming, test negative twice before returning to work, they've rescinded that um, because they realized that um, it was not a practice that was actually um, aligning with the science anymore. Um, and it was keeping people out of work unnecessarily. Um, so we, so in terms of the employees that to return to work, it's 10 to 14 days post, 10 to 14 days post symptom onset, as long as there's at least 72 hours of no symptoms. So it could be no earlier than 10 days, but it could be later upwards of, you know, 18, 20 days if they're still feeling symptomatic. Got it. And what if it was an asymptomatic person? Then it's, um, I'm, they, CDC just recently said seven days. I'm comfortable with 10. Um, it's where I'm comfortable. That's sure. what I tend to say. Um, okay. Thank you. Just to, uh, clear through the chairman clarification on that. No. Um, is it 10 days, 10 days after a test or 10 days after exposure? So it would be, um, if the person is asymptomatic, and um, then it would be 10 days from the day that they sh that they first tested positive. If the person is symptomatic, it's from the, the, the day that they first started showing symptoms. But I think Julie asked a question relative to the people that were isolating. Correct, Julie, did you know? Oh, I'm sorry, Julie, I missed that part. Yeah, no, my question was, oh, are, we, are we requiring, um, you know, teachers or admin to have a test or is them being quarantined for the time, um, you know, basically equivalent to that? I'm just curious as to like, do they test and quarantine or if they test, is that okay? Like what's the policy? So, uh, so that's, that's another good question. So if you're, if they're deemed a close contact, so if they've been in close contact, no matter what they have to do a 14 day quarantine um, and ideally um, test, um, test negative over the course of that, or sure. just get tested in general. Sure. And then, um, and then for those that have fallen into this quasi gray area of probable contact, but not deemed close contact, we say um, four to five days post exposure be tested. If asymptomatic and that test four to five days after exposure comes back negative, um, then the person is safe to return to work. But this is not for somebody who is like sharing space. It's more so for somebody who could have walked by the office or walked into yeah. the office, but everybody's you know, doing their, their duty of wearing masking and distancing. Um, it's for the term that I overuse right now, an abundance of caution. It's the most overused term. I know. Um, and, and, I feel right, bad even saying it. We are come up with a better term. And, and, in, and just to answer your question, does the staff, about the staff understanding, we have a very um, a thick binder that allows us to go into that binder for each case and be able to then share with whatever the situation is. You are somebody who is a, a positive case. You are somebody who's a close contact. You are somebody who's a potential contact. And between Meredith and the school nurse and uh, myself, those people have direct contact with us and we have a running chart to know exactly when somebody leaves us, when they can come back and what's required for them to come back because it is different depending upon who you are and what your status is, whether you're a positive, uh, a person with a positive test or whether you were in close contact. And so once that conversation is had and the person has been directed that information then comes back to the central office in which we are well aware and our principals are well aware the actual date someone can return and, and there's no questions about that. Um, that's how that is working. Got it, thank you. Mr. Matucci, did you have a question? No, just a comment if I could. Um, just wanna thank Lisa and the staff for getting those uh, kids, uh, those high needs kids back in the building, uh, the high school and the Cummings. And I know that this 
little speed bump uh, won't stop us from getting more kids in. Um, but I wanted to thank her for doing that in a timely fashion. Uh, as usual, um, Lisa and her staff uh, do a, a, just an unbelievable job. I just want to thank her for that. Thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question for you, Meredith. I, I, we were on this meeting when the uh, email came out for the town numbers for today. Um, have we got any increase, decrease? Um, yeah, so today, today, today we've had four. Um, yesterday we had 19. Saturday we had 19. Um, since this surge began on Tuesday night into Wednesday, we've had 81 cases confirmed. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, does anyone have any further questions for Meredith for the superintendent on her report? Hearing none, I'm gonna move on to homeschool applications. Ms. Gallivan, are there any new homeschool applications? And if so, can we get your recommendation? Yes, we have uh, two more um, applications. They're from the same family, a eight-year-old second grader and a 10-year-old fourth grader. And after reviewing their plans, I would recommend uh, approval. Okay, can I get a motion to ex uh, approve the uh, homeschool applications? I have a motion. Uh, all right, thank you, Ms. Uh, Swill. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Ms. Powell. Any discussion on them? Patty, can we have a roll call vote, please, for the record? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Okay, moving on to personnel. Ms. Howard, do you have any uh, personnel matters this evening? So the only personnel matter I have tonight is a posting uh, for a long-term substitute uh, math, a teacher uh, for math at Winthrop High School. Uh, we have posted that and um, are se actively seeking applicants, which we had been seeking uh, for a few weeks prior to the posting through school spring. Um, and we will continue uh, to, to do that. And that is the only item on the personnel that I have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Howard. Uh, moving on to new business, uh, high school activity fee. Can you bring us through that, please, Ms. Howard? Sure. Mr. Crombie um, had requested a reduction in the high school activity fee um, as we um, started school September 16th, which is a few weeks uh, later than we all had hoped to start um, school. And the activities that we're able to run this year are a little sort of backlogged. Um, we're trying to see what we can do virtually. Uh, and he feels strongly that um, to reduce that fee from $125 to $100 dollars um, would be um, the right thing to do given the amount of time we've lost in school. And Sue can chime in on that if she has anything she wants to add. So I, that would be his request and I, I believe the committee would uh, have to vote to reduce that fee as you set the fee at 125 uh, a, a few years ago, I believe. And, and what is the amount that they're asking to reduce to? To reduce it down to $100. And, and that's, we have activities up um, and running now. However, um, they may add more as we go along. We're, we're just sort of going with the flow and seeing what we can add as virtual activities. So that, and again, that was to uh, sort of compensate for the uh, late start of school. I'd like to entertain a motion uh, to reduce the uh, activity fee from $125 to $100. Second. I was asking for a motion, but I'll, I'll make the motion and, and accept your second. Okay. Can you add just for, it's for just this school year, if we may just have that language incorporated in it? That, that was the intent, yes. Any discussion? Hearing what none? Wait, Ms. I do have a question. What activities are we able to do now? I knew you'd ask that. I probably should have prepared that, and I did not. Uh, I can have Mr. Crombie get back to you on that, if you'd like. Or I, I'm, I'm just not 100% sure as to which uh, which activities he's actually running. Yeah, I, I guess I would like to understand what the kids are actually able to do and what this fee is is going to be covering. I can get I can get that information. We could take it up at the next meeting if that's helpful. So we we will, Mr. Boncori. Yeah, I, I agree with Jennifer. I I think we should know what activities are going on. 
And if we should be charging anything at all, if it's remote and nobody's actually participating live in, in doing any activity. So I'd like to table this for the next meeting and I would so move the table. Second. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Capobianco. I'd just like to say that I agree with Jen and President Boncori. I also feel uh, strongly, I'd like to know what fees we're doing. And I think that if we're doing some remote activities that the, the kids are going through enough and sh the family should not be charged for them. If it's something we could afford, I'd like to eliminate the fee for the year. Okay, we'll get more information that the motion's been tabled. Uh, we can come back and discuss it at our next uh, scheduled meeting. Ms. Brian, can I just say something? Sure. Um, I think that Matt is anxious to get this situated because he wants to try and get this going as quickly as possible. And if we wait another two weeks, that's another two weeks. The, you know what I mean? He, do you know what I mean? He's, he was really anxious about getting this up and I just wanted to let you know, that's what he said to me today. Okay. Just let you know. I, I think where it's, it's tabled for now. I think we need further information. Um, also, I'll, what have that. Be, I'll have that information for you. And, and what effect it will have on our budget if we do eliminate. I can't see it as being substantial, uh, but I want to make sure that if we do eliminate it completely, that we're not taking away from some other activity or some other uh, important issue uh, that the money is already uh, budgeted for. And so, I, you know, I understand that we all would rather not charge everybody, but we just have to keep in mind <laughs> that. As we go along, if more things are added, those are more salaries we have to pay for, and we have to just make sure we can cover them all without the activity fee. So I, I think that's part of what our discussion will be at our next meeting. If we could look at what the cost is, uh, what we have, what we are providing, what the cost is, and, and what the impact of eliminating it completely would be. So I think it gives us extra time. Uh, have that for the next meeting. And it's really not a debatable issue or motion on the table. Point. Ms. Galvin? Well, I don't know if it's the right time to add something. So <laughs> I just wanted to say that I, I can tell you what positions he's looking for, that, that that's part of the reason he wants to get this up and running because he, he needs to find teachers willing to do this on their own, you know, on their own time. And that's essentially, I believe, what most of the, um, the need for, as Ms. Eccles said, to get it started. I can, but I can tell you everything that he's posting or looking for positions that he wants to be able to, that, that would help clarify for you what he wants to do with the groups. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. I, I just think unemployment's at a record high and everyone has to cut costs. So I would prefer that we, we just table this and come back in two weeks and have a real conversation on it. I motion to table, it's not debatable. We should the, vote. Motion. the motion's been tabled. Oh, okay. So we're going to move on to our next meeting. Okay. The next uh, up is unfinished business superintendent's evaluation. I think we should take that off unfinished business for now, Patty. Sure. Uh, because I don't think it's going to be on there in the in the near future. Uh, do we have any further public comment this evening? Uh, let me just. Yes, we have Karen. Travis. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Good evening, Karen. I'm not sure if I'm encouraged or discouraged about Lisa's report. To hear that 31 kids could not go to school today because two people at the Gorman Ford Banks tested positive. I guess what I'm going to say are more comments than anything else. If schools do reopen as a hybrid, if students school personnel test positive, does that mean that the schools would close and re resume remote? Are there plans in place to be able to continue with the hybrid model? How much longer can the seniors and the juniors continue to be at home? The seniors need guidance in applying for, for college. The juniors supposedly are gonna to have to take MCAS, which they were supposed to take last spring, and they have not been given any extra help for that at all. The sophomores are gonna be scheduling to take in cast in the spring. And that's for a graduation requirement. What's gonna happen there? I, I, 
I understand what's going on, please. I, I understand completely. I understand the quarantine. I mean, I was in the profession long enough to know what this is all about. But again, I don't know if I'm, again, if I am discouraged or encouraged by any of this at all. I realize that um, Mrs. Howard cannot answer any of my questions tonight and I don't expect her to. But I think we really need to stop looking at how we're gonna be able to get these kids back in school sooner rather than later. Two, as I said earlier, two people test positive to Gorman Fort Banks. So that means that 31 kids could not start school today. And if what, what Meredith said is true, then after five to 10 days, whoever they walked by or looked at or whatever, I was testing, you know, still negative, these kids should be allowed in school. And my last thought is a positive thought. I wanna thank everybody for helping out with the, with the high school country fair. It is going very, very well. The junior class has outdone themselves not to be able to have the country fair as it's been in the last, I don't know how many years to be doing it the way they're doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Public comment, Patty? Um, I don't have any hands up, <clears throat> but I do have a letter that, um, that wanted to be read into public comment. Please, Patty. Okay. This is uh, dated on October 25th, 2020. Dear Mrs. Howard, I hope you were doing well. I first wanna start off with thank you. I don't know how much you hear those words, but I would guess not enough. Thank you for sacrificing your time and I'm sure your sanity for all the hours you put forth day in and day out, seven days a week, your job is not easy. So I hope you know how appreciative our household is for all the work you and the administration have been putting in. I am writing you this letter after seeing the last email around COVID in one of our schools. After reading the email, my heart sank for the teachers who contracted COVID and for the other teachers who could have been exposed. Let me begin by saying my family has lost four relatives to COVID. I have had four relatives who were alone in the hospital, four relatives who could not have family attend their services to say our final goodbye. We have lost four amazing people, which my family will not see again in our lifetime. I stress this loss because I do not want anyone else to experience it. I understand that I have the choice to not send my daughter if schools reopen. However, I am not writing this on behalf of the students, but the staff and teachers. I'm writing this because I don't want to see them in the hospital or someone to care for because they were carriers. I can understand in specific situations, this is beyond difficult, specifically if a parent has a child on an IEP or a little one with limited attending skills. I also feel for the parents who have to work and cannot afford childcare. I so get it for those families in these situations, and I understand and support the hybrid model for that population. However, it has been difficult seeing many parents demanding to reopen school to have these children indoors with their teachers, but they themselves are explicitly not following guidelines in their own lives. On any given day, drive by a park, you will see a lot of kids not distancing and not wearing masks, or as we just saw this week with the cluster spread, the adults staying in groups and not using protocols. Unfortunately, a lot of those adults and children are from households pushing to reopen. I cannot fathom the selfishness of thinking these guidelines do not apply to us. So teachers should be fine being indoors with my child. I am writing this letter in hopes that you will continue to use strong judgment around reopening, specifically with the safety of teachers in mind. Many of these teachers are in vulnerable populations for COVID. It is apparent to me that instead of being grateful for the fact the district has provided Chromebooks and internet assistance if needed and have bent over backwards to ensure our children are still learning during a pandemic, that this is not enough for them. We have been blessed with how hard the teachers and administration are working for our children. Please know that if you are feeling undue pressure from many, that you do not have that from our household. Please know that our family is grateful for what the district has achieved during an unprecedented time. And we support you in putting the health and well being of the people who sacrifice for our children consistently above all else. Thank you so much again for your time. Kindest regards, Shauna Hodge Barnett. Thank you. Is there any further public comment? No, there is not. Okay, I'll move on to public relations. Ms. Barry? Yes. 
I do actually. Um, thank you. Um, you know, the, this recent out, uh, cluster of outbreaks is a step back for us at a time when we were starting to really make some progress with getting back into the classroom. Um, that being said, I also think that this outbreak has shown our community that the schools are prepared and can open safely while dealing with cases of COVID that are bound to arise. Um, I also want to give Lisa and her team a huge shout out. I'm proud of the response plan that has been put in place and feel now more than ever that our schools can and should reopen safely. Sadly, I feel that it's the children in this community that are paying the price of this illness the most. There are no organized school sports. There will be no fall musicals and Halloween activities and other holiday events have already been canceled. Unfortunately, substance abuse, cyberbullying, and depression and anxiety are all at an all time high for children in our town. And I think we all have to look at ourselves and at our own behavior to truly understand what's going on here. While we can't change what's been done, we can make an effort going forward to do better. One area of grave concern for me are the toxic discussion groups that are taking place on Facebook. We need to stop the constant finger pointing and shaming. What kind of an example is being set for the children in this town? These children are watching and have learned that it is okay to sit behind a keyboard and insult anyone that doesn't agree with them. The children in this community are watching and they're following the lead. We're all in this thing for the long haul and right now, the way people are behaving, it's not sustainable. I ask that the next time someone wants to say something nasty to your neighbor on social media, remind yourself that someone's kid is watching and learning with every keystroke you make. So I beg anyone that is listening, please be good humans mm -hmm. and please do better for this community and these kids. Thank you. Mr. Boncori, do you have anything to say today? Thank you. Well said, Julie. I uh, agree 100% that this town has to become more unified and people should be loving their brother and their neighbor and not attacking them because they have a different point of view. We had a very serious uh, bad week moving into our 11th week of being in the red with 81 cases from Wednesday to today and not knowing how many today but seeing the lines of people getting tested today. The line was double lined all the way from the testing site up past the library at one time and police had to come in and, and direct traffic and try to work out a plan where they got, then allowed them to be double lined coming down uh, uh, Pauline Street and onto Walden Street and, and blocked a lot of traffic sending it other ways. So I would assume there were probably at least 500 people or more tested today and who knows what that will bring in addition to the 81 that we've already had this week. People, we've been saying it for months and months. Please, use common sense, social distance, wear your mask if you're near anyone at all. Wash your hands. No need for people to be bar hopping from one club to another to another when they're only supposed to be in a restaurant to have a drink with food. So it, it's the adults that I think have to wake up and not the children who are suffering. So if the adults in this town would wake up, the children would be back in school and not suffering. Please, use common sense. Thank you, Mr. Boncori. Mr. Captain Bianco, do you have anything this evening? Thank you. I just want to say I agree with, uh, with my colleague Julie and, and President Boncori. I also want to thank Shauna Hodge Barnett for that heartfelt email. And the divisiveness in this town has to stop. We're all in this together. Everybody has been affected by this virus negatively. I don't know anyone who is, who is benefiting from it. And we just have to work together as a team. We have to do our best. We have to mask up. And the divisiveness on social media has to stop. I think everyone agrees kids are better off with the schools open. But if it keeps going like this, it's not going to happen. Thank you, Mr. Captain Bianco. Ms. Swope, do you have anything this evening? Um, I agree with what has been said, and I, you know, Julie and I have talked uh, about this. I, I'm all about the physical safety, physical and health safety of the kids, and I don't think we can open unless we are, are have agreed that we can do better in making sure that we are safe in this community. So. Um, I think we can do it. Just have to put our minds to it. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. 
Uh, Mr. Matucci, do you have anything this evening? Sir. Okay. Uh, Ms. Powell, do you have anything? No. Okay, I just want to say thank you. Oh, Ms. Howard? Yeah, I just uh, I want to add one thing when I, I typically don't uh, add anything during the public relations time. Uh, and I think folks have uh, articulated their thoughts very well. Um, you know, just in listening to Mr. Boncori, you know, this is our 11th week in the red. 80 cases in one week is is bizarre. Um, and the finger pointing, of course, has to stop. And, and that's just a given. Um, I want to thank the, the recognition for being prepared and having a response plan. I could tell you endless hours of attention have been spent on creating that response plan. As I said in the email that I sent to the school committee, um, I, I believe it was that email in which I said, I prepared these along with a team of people. So it's not just me, there's a whole group of people that are working on this stuff. Um, and, and in preparing them and finishing them, you know, the hope is we, we spent all that time and we never have to look at them. Um, having a response plan, I can tell you, is not a safety net and it is not a cure and it is not a guarantee that everybody will remain safe. By no means did I think that during this time, knowing the crisis that we're in, that we were going to be back at school in a hybrid plan, or we're gonna have teachers back in the building in a remote plan. Never did I think that we weren't going to have a positive case in the school. That's just a given. And we have a response plan for it. What I can say is the condition that this community is in right now, that response plan is gonna be all that we do from eight in the morning until three in the afternoon if we were to open the doors in a full hybrid plan right now. And people need to be mindful of that. We need to have a controlled community number before we can control anything within the buildings. Um, so I, as much as I agree that our students and our children and our staff need to be in school, there may not be many more people that understand the impact of the social emotional well-being and the impact on our special needs students than me. And I'm working as hard as I can to get our students back in. But I will not, absolutely will not do it for any other reason, but we're ready to go back and we can manage our students safely in that building and our staff. It would be irresponsible to just say, we now have a plan and we have protocols and we know how to react. So let's open the doors. We need to get the community numbers under control. And that's everyone from parents, to every adult, to our store owners, and to our to our children. Um, once that is, is in place and our numbers are better, we'll be able to start the conversation about going back to school uh, for our students, for all of our students, not just our high need students. And in terms of the pause for the uh, Gorman Fort Bank students, that, that pause is not because two teachers tested positive. That pause is because we have to factor in also what's happening in the community. It just so happens that it happened at the same time. You know, these numbers, 80, you know, 80 or 81 numbers in a week. Right. And we need to get it under control. So please follow the rules. Even if you don't believe in them, help us get our students back in school and give them a chance. Because right now they're home. And, and if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for our students so that we can get these numbers down and get our kids back. Thanks, Lisa. That will be the end of my public relations. Thank you, and 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 that will be my last uh, is is for me to say uh, thank you, Lisa, uh, and to Meredith and uh, the faculty and staff of the Winthrop School System that worked around the clock the last week uh, to keep these kids safe and to keep this under control. And again, thank you, Meredith, and thank you, Lisa, and your faculty and staff. And now I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay. I get a second. Okay. Second by Mr. Boncori. Patty, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, Ms. Barry? Yes. Mr. Boncori? Yes. Mr. Capabianco? Yes. Mr. Matucci? Yes. Ms. Swope? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. Mr. Perrin? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Night, night all.